you have your Bibles with you, back to the book of Joshua, the 10th chapter. Joshua chapter number 10, if you would be so kind. And uh, we kind of take a little bit of a back step and look back in chapter uh, number 9. We see that the Gibeonites are now joining the league with Israel. If you look in chapter 9, verse 27, and Joshua made them, that's the Gibeonites, that they, uh, that day, hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, and the place which he should choose. And so here we see that now that they have gone back, uh, the uh, Gibeonites uh, knew that Joshua and the Israelite and their God was strong and powerful and mighty. And so instead of uh, uh, trying to fight against them, they realized the best thing they could do was to get in league with them. And in order to do, do that, they realized that they had to make it look like they had come from a far, 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 far away country. And so they laid down, or they laid their uh, animals down with heavy loads, and they wore old clothes and wore out shoes, and their uh, their wine uh, bottles and stuff was old and cracked and everything. And it made it look like they traveled a long, long way, and they only traveled roughly from Round Rock to Prince George. I mean, yeah, Red Rock to Prince George. Not a very far distance that they traveled, but it made it look like they traveled a long, long way. And so they deceived Israel and making them think that they were from a long way. So they made a treaty. They made a league with them. And so when it found out that they had tricked them, that they said, okay, we've made a promise to you. We made a promise in God's name. We made a vow. We made a commitment. And we will keep that. But we've got news for you. You will now be hewers of wood. In other words, they're going to chop all their wood, gather up all their wood, and the haulers of water. They're going to uh, bring all the water in so that the congregation, and particularly uh, the tabernacle of God, will have everything that they need to carry out their worship to God. Now, the reason why Israel was deceived and fell for the deception is back in chapter 9 and verse number 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. That is the problem right there. They looked at their victuals. They looked at all their foods. They looked at all their provisions. They looked at all their supplies. And by sight, they made a, division, a decision. They looked at the victuals there and they said, you know what, these really look like they are old. They really look like moldy bread. They really look like it's come from them. And so by, by sight, they made a decision without prayer. Notice, and ask not at the at council at the mouth of the Lord. You know, the many decisions that I make and the many decisions that you make, it is always best that we take time to pray about them. It is always best that we take the time to pray about that or we will fall into some deceptions. As a matter of fact, the problems that I have with myself and some of the bad decisions I've made, they were not made because I spent time talking to the Lord. I saw something and with my eyes, it affected my heart and I said, you know what? I desired that. I coveted that. I want that. Now, whether I could afford it or not, I decided that I wanted it so I went and got it. And that's what happens a lot of times when we live by sight instead of by faith. We need to understand that we have to trust God and realize that God knows what's best for your life and for my life. And so we come to understand this. And so the deception of Israel and to why they were deceived into a treaty with the Gibeonites was simply because they did not take the time to pray about it. And so, if you go away with anything today, understand the importance of prayer. With every decision, I'm talking about even the smallest decision. And even a decision that we make over and over and over and over again, we might need to take the time to pray about it. We, have, we, we make decisions all the time. And some, we, you know, they're just unconscious decisions. But sometimes we need to bring into our captivity the thoughts into the obedience of Christ and to 
question was, again, what it is that we need to do and, and began to look as to what God would have for us. Now, we see that in verse 27 of chapter 9 that now there are, there are hewers of wood and drawers of water. And notice what happens because they're in a league with Israel and Joshua and them. In verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, now it came to pass. Now it came to pass. Now, now that the word is out that the Gibeonites had made a league, had made a treaty with Israel and with Joshua and with their God, and the word is out now, and people are beginning to hear about this. When it now it came to pass, when uh, 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 Adonai Zedek, a king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken an Ai and had utterly destroyed it, and as he had done to Jericho and her king, and so that he had done it to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gideon had made peace with Israel and were among them, verse 2, that they feared greatly. Now, here's what happened. There began to be a panic amongst the pagans and the people there of the land of Canaan. They were very pagan. They were very ungodly. And they practiced blood sacrifice. They practiced the offerings of, of babies. They, they offered women. Uh, they, they, they were just a terrible pagan country in a pagan land. Uh, after uh, Joseph and the people of God had left there all those 400 years earlier, and the pagan heart of man had taken over the Canaanite, and that's why God said, you go into the land of Canaan and you destroy every one of them. Get them completely out of there because they were so pagan. And it happened in 400 years how that, that those people that were left behind there, how that they continued on into paganism. Now, Adonai, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, uh, it is interesting. Here is the king of Jerusalem, Adonai. You know what Adonai means? It means God. It's the name of the Lord. It means the Lord. That's his name, Adonai. Adonai Zedek. And, and, and he has this amazing name. And he is, as it says here, the king of Jerusalem. And, and, and he has this amazing name. His name means the Lord of justice or the Lord of righteousness. That's what his name means. He has a heritage. You go back now. He's from Jerusalem. And his last part of his name is Zedek. If we go back some 400 years earlier, we see that there was a king of Salem, a prince of Salem, a king of Salem by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. This is very likely a descendant of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek had no records of father or mother. We do not know much about him. He was a priest. He was a priest of God, a priest and a king of Salem. And you take Jerusalem, and you see the descendants here, how that out of the 400 years, one who was a, 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 a prophet of God, uh, one who was a prince with God, one Melchizedek, as we see him, that even Abraham gave him tithes. And we see this, and this is all before Moses. This is all before they left uh, 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 um, the land of uh, Canaan, the, uh, the promised land to go down in Egypt. We see this back in Genesis, all the way back in Genesis. And now we see this Odona who has a great name, a name of the Lord of righteousness, a, a king of, of Salem and my righteousness. And now we see him as a pagan king. Man, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen in generations to come. But we have a responsibility to teach our children the Word of God today. Amen. We have a responsibility to bring up our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We have a responsibility today. We do not know what will happen here in the future, but we do know that God has given us children. God has given us, and what a name, what's in a name like Adonai Zedek. What, what a great name that is. You know, as a Christian, we have a great name. The Bible talks about as Christians, that's our name, as we see the first called Christians at Antioch. Do you know why they were called Christians at Antioch? 
Because they were living like Christ. A Christian is a Christocentric, a Christ-centered individual, a follower of Jesus Christ. And it is so evident in their life that they were following Jesus, they were living after Christ, that the people at Antioch, they didn't call themselves Christians. They didn't go around saying, we are followers of Christ and we're Christians. No, their lives demonstrated to everybody around them that they were followers of Jesus Christ. And as a derogatory name, they called them Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And that wasn't a good name. That was a put down name. That was a terrible name. Yet, what a name that we have. To be called a Christian. To be, have a life that would reflect that. The second time we see the word Christian in the New Testament, we see Paul standing before King Agrippa. And Paul, for the sec uh, second or third time, maybe the fourth time, he gives his testimony how that he was a persecutor of God to become a follower of God. And, uh, and Agrippa saw the life of Paul and he saw and heard what Paul had to say about being a Christian. And King Agrippa looked at Paul and he simply says, Almost, almost, almost thou persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. What a tragedy it is to be so close and yet die in his sins. Yet die in his sins. The third time the word Christian is moved, uh, is mentioned in the book of the New Testament, we see it down in 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 rather. And we talked about how that all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It talks about, uh, well, let's go over there. I can't remember. I had my verse and I. I thought I had it memorized. My mind's not working for me right now. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 16. I'll just read it right out of the book. Amen. Yea, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. We are not to be ashamed to be as identified as a Christian. Now, we're living in a postmodern generation. We're living in a postmodern time, and it's going to be more and more difficult to live out your name as a Christian than ever before. There are those of the political correctness, there are those of the social engineering of our society that is turning against Christianity. And yet, if you and I live like a Christian and demonstrate our lives like a Christian, you will suffer some persecution for that. And you will be challenged in that. We have a name and we need to realize our name is a great name and we are to live out our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And you begin to live out your Christian life and the suffering and the persecution will come at some point. You mark it down. You will have to take a stand as a Christian. But let me tell you, as you're walking with God, if you're reading your Bible every day, and if you're praying like you should, and you have a devotional life, you, you, you get you something to read, you get you some things, you read some biographies of Christian men and women, you read things that will help you in your Christian walk and in your Christian life. That's why we provide the straight path. Because it is an excellent discipleship book that will help you and I grow. If you are going through and feeding your heart and feeding your mind with the Word of God and the things of God, when the trials come, you will be able to stand. Notice what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What he is simply saying, if we are going to live our lives and say that we are Christians, we need to depart from iniquity. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to be sinners because all of us are going to sin. We're going to lose our temper. 
Uh, something's going to happen every day of our life. The world, the flesh is there is what we battle with because we are in spiritual warfare and we're not perfect, but let everyone the name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It is time that God's people set out to say, you know what? I am going to live a life under Jesus Christ. I am going to look as to what He says in His Word and what He has to teach us from the doctrines and from the truths of the Word of God. And I am, by the grace of God, is going to live that out in my life. And by the grace of God, I'll not have a denominating sin over me. I will truly come and try to strive to live for Jesus Christ and never before. What's in the name? Adonai Zedek. It was a, a, a name of, of the Lord of justice. The Lord of righteousness. Here he is a pagan. There are some people that claim the names of Christ and say that they're a Christian and yet they're pagan. They, they, their, their desires is no different than the unsaved. Uh, their, their, uh, their, their lifestyle is no different. When people get saved, there ought to be a change in their hearts and lives. And by the way, that change is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. It is a work of the Holy Spirit of God with the Word of God and with the church of God teaching and proclaiming the truths of the Word of God. Give me another name. Name that I'm proud of. I'm a Baptist. Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I'm gone, I'm Baptist dead. I have no, no, no apology for being a Baptist whatsoever. When we look at Baptist history, when we look at those people and what they've gone through, and, and we, can, we can really rejoice. And, and, and I've made these statements, and I've had people get upset with me, but I've had, not had anybody show me any difference. I believe that all the churches in the New Testament were Baptist churches. Now, a lot of people say, don't ask God. Show me where they did not baptize people in deep water. I mean, you only had, for, for years and years and years before man came up with all the different denominations, you only had two, you only had one true church, and that was a church that practiced believers' baptism in deep water throughout the whole New Testament. But John tells us they went out from us because they were not of us. Because they, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But there was those, and by the way, from the very beginning, all the churches in the New Testament, they all had problems. There wasn't any of them perfect. But one of the things that they all did, they believed that salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They believed that after a person got saved, they got baptized in deep water. Jesus walked 100 kilometers to get baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. He didn't walk all that way for John to sprinkling. He didn't walk all that way for John to pour water on him. He walked all that way to be baptized in deep water. All the New Testament churches had practiced deep water baptism. It wasn't until uh, about uh, 300 years later or so when, when uh, the, the, the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic and the Catholic churches and stuff, they started bringing in the sprinkling and the pouring. But if you look at the old cathedrals of many of the old Catholic churches, you see that they had a baptistry in them. Because they believed that there was deep water baptism. But it was out of convenience that they went and started sprinkling people. So I would like for anybody to show me where that in the New Testament that a, number one, a baby was baptized because you don't find it there. Number two, where somebody was baptized with just pouring or sprinkling. Because baptism is a picture of the death, Christ died on the cross, the death, the burial, He was put down, and the resurrection. And so if you have any other baptism, it destroys that picture. And that's what the gospel is. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so here we see that, uh, that, that there is an importance with this. Now, just like Adonai, uh, Adonai Zedek was a pagan, just like Christians who name the name of Christ and yet they live like they're a child of the devil and just like Baptists are just those who are just followed after the way of the world, there are no perfect churches. Understand that. But thank God that we have a great history that we can look to. Now I want you to go back to the scripture here and I want you to notice what happened. The panic of these kings. In verse number one, it says that the king of Jerusalem had heard now listen to what he had heard. He had heard, number one, 
how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and to her king, so that he had done to Ai and her king. So the key here, he had heard, first of all, what God was doing through Joshua, the man of God, and Israel, the people of God. How that they were now taking over the land of Canaan like God told them to do. They had heard how they crossed the, 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 the uh, Jordan River on dry land. They had heard about Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. And they heard how that at Ai they lost a battle, but then they went back and they took Ai. And Ai was a, one of the most powerful cities in all the regions that were there. They had heard all of this. But notice in verse number one again, the king of Jerusalem had heard how Joshua, now look down in the middle of the verse, it says, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. I mean, let me tell you something. The king was really panicking because he had heard, first of all, what God had done with Joshua and Israel, and now he had heard that his neighbor, Gibeon was about oh, 22 kilometers away from Jerusalem. That's not very far. And he said, you know what? His neighbors now had joined up with Joshua and with Israel. And he said, you know what? The Gibeonites, they're tough people to fight. They are very proud, very strong. They're very warrior-like. And yet now we're going to have to be battling against them and they realized what had taken place. And because of the, the alliance and because of what God has done, verse 2 says that they feared greatly. Oh, let me tell you something. If we could just get the folks in this room, if we could just get the folks in this room this morning to have a great fear of God, <laughs> my, what God would do with us and for us and through us. We've been raised with an attitude for years. We see it in the clothing of the teenagers. No fear. No fear. No fear. Now, I know what they mean by no fear. They mean being daring. But I'm afraid we've raised a generation of people that have no fear of God. He is truly awesome and all-powerful. He is all-loving. But He cares for us, and He is one that needs to be looked to. And they greatly feared, or feared greatly, because the Gibeonite was a great city as one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than Ai, and all the men there were mighty. I mean, let me tell you something. I, I, King Adonai said he was really concerned. He was starting to panic. He said, you know what? We hear about God, uh, uh, Jehovah Yahweh, and we hear about Joshua and, and, and the Israelites, and now they've got these Ai, uh, uh, and they took Ai, and now they've got the Gibeonites on their side. And so great fear was taking over them. And so number three, we see the king uh, uh, went, of Jerusalem went, and he got four other kings with him. And notice verse 4. Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gideon. This is the reason why they're going to go against Gideon. For it had made peace with Joshua and with the children of God. He says, you know what? You've got to come up and help us. We need to rally the troops. We need to get together. And all five of the Amorite kings in the mountain countries in which this is all taking place, in the central part of the country there, all these mountain men, all these soldiers, all these kings of all these cities that are mentioned, all five of them, you say, oh, we need to go, and we need to go against the Gideonites, and we need to teach them a lesson. We need to teach them that they have no business leaving their alliance with us no business in going and joining themselves with the people of God. And he says, he calls them all together. And he says, come up and help, for it, uh, Gideon has made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Verse 5, therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jeremiah, the king of Lassen, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up and all their hosts and encamped before Gideon and made war against it. Now here's what's happened. Gideon's a walled city. Most all the cities were walled cities. And Gideon could have stayed, could have kept them out. But they got out in the very plains in front of them and all their men and all the kings were there and their horses 
bullets and their and their artillery and everything that they had. There are five different kings and there are five different armies and there are mighty kings and there are mighty armies and they're scattered out all over the plains right before them. They're going to show them a letter, lesson. They're going to show them the what's to is all about. They turned against them. Now, these folks were friends at one time or neighboring clans or challenging clans, if you please, that the Gibeonites have truly now fallen after God. And there's been a change in their lives. And you know what? Here we see that they have turned against them because they have joined themselves with God. Now let me give you a thought here. Here's a person, uh, he's not a bad person, you know, he's unsaved, he's not a Christian. You know, he might live, you know, he goes out and does whatever your friends would do out here, you know, as far as living their life, you know, drinking, doping maybe, booze, and I have no idea what their lives are like. But all of a sudden, they get saved. And they become a believer in Jesus Christ. And their whole life has changed. The anger they used to have, they don't have it anymore. The foul words that used to come out of their mouth, they don't come out anymore. Uh, they don't have the desire for drink. They don't have the desire for drugs. They uh, their lives are completely changed. And then look at their friends. Whoa, man, you you one of them now? You know? And they turn on them. And they try to ruin their testimony and try to ruin their life. That's what they did. There was a young man that was drafted in the United States Army. And he would get down on his bed every night beside his bed and he would pray and the other soldiers mocked him and ridiculed him and made fun of him and one night while well, it wasn't very long in there one night they all threw their boots at him and threw their boots at him and made fun of him and mocked him and ridiculed him the next morning all of their boots were spit shine at the bottom of their beds he spent most of the night spit shining their boots and putting them back where they belong and yet they still mocked him and ridiculed him. You know what? He knew that living as a Christian is going to bring on that persecution. Living as a Christian is going to bring on that trial. When we come to understand how that as a believer in Jesus Christ, that we are to live out our lives. Families have turned against Christian people. Because once they were happy that they lived the way that they did, but once they became believers, they weren't happy with them anymore. Because they now put Christ first in their hearts and in their lives. Look with me two verses of Scripture to help you with this. Set up Acts chapter 14, if you would please. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, verse number... I should have had it marked in the place. Mark chapter, Mark, Mark 4. Acts chapter uh, 14, notice if you would, verse number 22. Paul and them went about, he said, verse 20, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice again, Paul was going around. They were confirming the soul. They were helping the disciples. They were exhorting them. They were encouraging them to continue on in the faith. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going on. And he says and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, as a Christian, we will have trials. We will have tribulations. We will have testings. Now look with me. Paul writes to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, if you would please, and verse number uh, chapter 3 again. We were right there. Chapter 3, and yea, and verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So here, all these five Amorite kings are turning against Gibeon. Why? Because Gibeon had yielded over to God. And they didn't like that. And the devil doesn't like it when you yield to God and when you get saved. And so he doesn't like it. But that's okay. That's okay. 
Because we know that Jesus Christ died so we can have everlasting life through Him. Notice verse number 6 back if you would please. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua uh, the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand uh, for thy, from thy servants. Come up to us and quickly, uh, quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And so here we see the appeal. Uh, now, now when, when the king of Jerusalem, when he panicked, he got everybody he could together. Now, now the Gibeonites are looking out in the plain and it is filled from, uh, from hillside to hillside, from creek to creek, from as far back as you can see. It is filled with the five nations that are there, the five kings and their people, their men of war. And so now they're making an appeal to Joshua. And they say, very simply, slack not your hand from thy servant. Come up to us quickly. Save us. Help us. The troubles that they're seeing is right before them. They look out and they say, man, we've got to have help. We cannot do this. Now, this was a strong city. The Gibeonites was, was, was a very strong place. It was stronger than Ai. Ai was one of the stronger. It was stronger than all the other cities that were around. It was a very fortified city. They could have spent days, months, even years without having to give it in, but they realize this trouble, it needs to be dealt with immediately. Now that teaches us something. When there's something wrong, deal with it immediately. If there is a trouble, if there is a problem, if there is a situation, deal with it ASAP, as soon as possible. Well then, honey, I, I, I was driving and, and this red light came on on the dashboard. You know what you tell your wife? Pull over and stop. Right there. I'll be right there. Don't drive me any further. There is a warning light. And when the warning light goes off, don't say, oh, that's pretty neat. Let's just keep going. No. Now stop and do something about it as quickly as you can. Their troubles of the Gibeonites, they appeal, they realized that their resources were there. Notice what they said. They cried out to Joshua. And, and that was down at the camp of Gilgal with all the people of God and, and they cried out to him for save us and they cried out to help they realized that their resources was Joshua, was Israel and their God and they had confidence in Joshua they said you know what we are the hewers of wood and, 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 and we're the haulers of water and, 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 and we are their people now and, and, and they made a pledge to us and, and, and we come and so they pleaded out to Joshua notice he said save us that's complete dependence upon them and then he said help us and that's the determination of the people themselves they said, you know what, we need your help. We're doing what we can do, but we need your help. And you know, when it comes to God, we, we want Him to save us, to give us complete deliverance. But in our Christian life, we need to have His help so that we can do what we can do, and God will do what He will do. You see, a lot of times Christians you have the idea that God's going to do everything. God is going to do everything, but He's going to do it through you and through me. We, we must be willing to, to understand this. They said, save us. That was dependence upon Joshua and Israel. Help us. That was the determination. We're going to do what we can do. We're going to hold out as long as we can. We will fight against them. When God opens up our eyes to the troubles that are around us, whether it's finances and whether it's physical, whether it's with our children, whether it's with our relatives, whether it's at work, whether it's at church, wherever God opens our troubles, our eyes to see the troubles, He wants us to realize that we can come to Him because He will lead us through those troubles. He, we can have confidence in Christ through those troubles. And we can understand that our prayer for help and for salvation and guidance comes from God. So whatever trouble that you have, realize that you have a resource as a Christian, as a believer, that God is there to help you. Man, when it's too much month at the end of the money, what do you do? You cry out to God. 
He said, Lord, where are we going to be able to supply this? And what's God? When we become that place that where the troubles of the Gibeonites and the troubles of the believers come and God opens our eyes to these troubles, He is saying, listen, you're going to have some troubles, you're going to have some trials, you're going to have some ailments, you're going to have this, that, and the other, and these are there so that you can depend upon Me. That you can look to Me. Now, if everything's jelly but the jar, and by that I mean everything is fine as frog hairs, split four ways. I mean, everything is just smooth. There's money in the bank. You're all healthy. I, I mean, the kids are happy. Mama's happy. If mama's happy, everybody's happy. I mean, when everything is going all so smooth, everything is in its right place and everything is fine, a lot of folks don't call out for God for help. They're in too comfortable of a position. And by the way, we in North America, we get in that position quite a bit. We do. Amen, preacher. Go to Europe, go to uh, some of these other countries, the Philippines and other places around, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see how well we have it here. But when we have a trial, when we have a tribulation, ah! you know what? We can go to God. We can go to Him. Help for the Gibeonites was there. The Gibeonites, they were saved from the wrath of God in chapter 9. They were saved from the wrath of God in chapter 9. Chapter 9, they deceived Joshua and the children of Israel, and they were saved from the wrath of God. What was the wrath of God? To annihilate everybody in the land of Canaan. And they were saved from the wrath of God. We see in chapter 10, now, now they're saved from the wrath of their enemies. We see that they're going to be saved from the wrath of their enemies. They, they were blessed. I want us to realize that for you and I, as believers, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are saved from the wrath of God to come. We have been transported from darkness into light. We are now born again children of God, and what a blessing that is. We do not have to fear the wrath of God because we have Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. What a blessing it is. But as a Christian, we must understand that we don't have to fear the wrath of our enemies as well. The devil, the world, and the flesh cannot get to us other than what God will allow it to do. And God allows them to challenge us and to be able to, but we'll never know the wrath of the devil, we'll never know the wrath of this world, and we'll never know the wrath of ourselves. Why? Because God's delivered us from our enemies. Now, He's going to allow them to come in and to irritate us, so that we can look to God. So that we can look to God. Now notice last of all the courage of Joshua. Verse number 8. Well, verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thy hands. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Here we see the courage of Joshua because he hears from God. He hears from God. Let me tell you something. When you get up in the morning and you open your Bible and you hear from God, you've got some courage to go for the day. When I open up my Bible and I read the Scripture that God lays on my heart, the area of which I'm reading, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, I am encouraged of the Lord. When I open up my devotion, I love the straightway pass. Uh, when I, open, I mean, almost every day I think speaks to me in some way God uses that. It is able to help us to realize that we can have courage to go to God and realize what God has for us. Now note that God gave the encouragement is what I'm saying. We need to realize where we do our duty as believers, God is always there to encourage us. He's always there to enable us. I'll read that to you again. When we do our duty as believers, God is always there to encourage us and to empower us to do that which we are able to do. He, the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thy hand. <laughs> he said, You've already won the battle. Man, this is, this is going to be a breeze. This, this is going to be a rainstorm. Actually, hell is going to come. But this is, this is what we're going to... I'm taking care of this, the Lord, so Joshua. 
And what a blessing. Joshua was going to do his duty. He was going to go and fulfill his obligation to the Gibeonites. He was going to go up and fight against them. And God says, you know what? I'm going to give you. And you know when we say to God, God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll surrender my life and I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to say. God has already given us the victory. And to Him belong the glory. Amen? The old promises have been tried and proven again and again to be sufficient. Now when the old promises have been provided and they've been tested and they have been proven and they have been sufficient for everything, it helps us to claim new promises for God. I'll give you an example. Go back to Joshua chapter 1. All of this is because of the promise that God gave Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. There, now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place of the soul of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I, gave, as I said to Moses. So here's a promise. He said, everywhere you go, I am going to be with you. That's a promise. And so Joshua is learning this promise. He learned it when they crossed over River Jordan. He learned it at the Battle of Jericho. He learned it at the Battle of Ai. And he realized that God's promise was true. Verse number 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So every place... And the promise says, I'm going to be with you at all time. Every place you go, Joshua, I'm going to be with you at all the time. I'm going to be with you. Uh, I will, uh, as I was with Moses, I will be, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now go back and hold your hand there in chapter 1, but go back in chapter 10 and look again at verse number 8. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. For I have delivered them into thy hand, and there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Is that not a promise that was built upon? He had that promise, and now he saw the promise again. And we go back to verse 6 of chapter 1. Be strong and of good courage. For on this people thou shalt divide the inheritance of the land which I swear unto their father. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do. This book of the law, verse 8, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou this way, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. The promises that God gives us, and that we claim those promises, and believe those promises, and we see that God is sufficient in needing those promises, that means tomorrow, God's going to allow us through our tribulations and trials and living in this world, another opportunity to claim another promise. And it might be a promise that we've never claimed before. But we claim God for that promise, and God is sufficient in that promise, so that God will give us another promise that we can claim. And so here we see the promises of God. We must remember the promises that God gives us. So why? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Because you and I can stand on the promises of God. We can have our lives shine in this world, a light in darkness, standing on the promises of God. And the first promise is that Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You come. You come and you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He will receive you. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. No, but He does. And His blood cleanses us from all sin. And you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There is a promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now in the context, he's dealing with the church. But in application, he deals with our heart as well. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to be your personal Savior. 
He stands and He knocks. Will you say, come in, Jesus? Forgive me of my sins. Be my personal Savior. You say, Pastor, I've done that. Have you followed the Lord in believer's baptism? Have you said, yes, I'm going to be obedient to God and, 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 and follow the Lord in the picture of His death, His burial, and His resurrection? Have you started to read and to study the Word of God and devote your life to finding out the things of God? God will strengthen you. God will enable you to be the victorious Christian that you can be. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your love for us. Father, we pray that the Spirit of God would take this simple message and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Help us to be open as we have our invitation time and there are those here that do not know for sure that when they die that they'd go to heaven. Lord, may they come. Let me take their hand. Let me have a word of prayer with them. Let me take the Bible and show them how that they can be saved. Or one of our folks sit down with them from the Word of God and show them how that they can know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are having a very difficult time. We pray that they would be undergirded with the power of the Spirit of God in their hearts and their lives. Oh, Father, speak to our hearts today. We'll give you the praise of the Lord, Lord, in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, so Lance coming to the piano to play, and she plays a verse of invitation. If God spoke into your heart, you talk to the Lord. You might want to slip down to your knees. You might want to use your front chair here to pray. You might want to come and have a word of prayer with me and let me uh, encourage you in the Lord and pray for you. If you want to know how to be saved, know for sure that when you die that you go to heaven. We'd love to take the Word of God and show you what it is to trust Christ as your Savior.